It is said when one serves one's guru. You see, there's a, there's a special commitment for students not to take bias over one's guru. Oh, one's guru is very famous and has a big name and is well known, we'll listen to them. And whatever they say is correct. But if our guru is not famous or not well known or doesn't have the rank or status, then whatever they say, we don't need to listen to them. And it's overridden by another. And some people actually run around doing this. You know, my guru said that, and then, well, you have a few gurus, and your one guru said this before the other, this guru said this after the other, and they take precedence at the fame of the Lama. At the, at the, sometimes at the fame of the Lama, in the background, and also the rank, and that's very wrong. Why? In your meditations, your guru should be of equal level. With the deepest respect to someone like His Holiness, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Kansan Rinpoche and Geshe Tsudim Gelsen, to me in my mind, are three equal Buddhas. One cannot be higher than the other. So how do we do that? Whatever Guru has told us the first thing first, we do that first. Whatever Guru tells us something opposite or contradictory or different, we don't need to follow because we have the instruction of our first Guru. So let's say if one of my teachers told me, you have to practice yellow. You have to meditate on yellow, and you have to do a three-year, three-month, three-day retreat on yellow. And then my next guru comes along, you know, and this guru is a normal monk from Ganden, but he's, you know, he's my guru. Then the next guru comes along and happens to be his eminence, his holiness, the 56th emanation of Vajrapani, and you know, he floats in the sky, he's got Damarus, he's got 5,000 students in 20,000 centers around the world, and you know, he's fabulous, and uh, when he says, oh no, you do green, and uh, you do uh, one year. Then you say, ooh, one year instead of three, doo -doo -doo. So you tell everybody, well, this guru told me I have to do one year, and that one said three years. So then we twist it around and say, His Holiness, His Eminence, or we'll make it short, Vajrapani told me <laughs> that I just have to do one year. But the real issue here is not Vajrapani told you, it's your own self-grasping, self-centered mind using politics with your holy gurus to get your advantage. When students say, this guru said that, this guru said that, this guru said that, no, no. His Holiness Vajrapani, His Eminence Vajrapani, definitely may, in reality, a reality check here, may have clairvoyance over your ordinary guru. It may have. But the minute you think that, if you do the bigger name guru's practice and ignore your normal guru's one, no attainments. Why? You've already made a distinction. You made a distinction. So in Tibetan community, there is sometimes this kind of conflict where one tradition says this, and one, one sect will say this, and one lama will say this, one temple, one center, one guru, one master will say this, the other one says this, then they say this, and, this, and, and then people don't know what to do, and they decide to follow what, where the herd follows. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that, and I'll tell you why. Because the herd jumps over the uh, ledge, I'm not going to jump with them. Simple as that. So for me, whatever my previous gurus had told me to do, and I promised them, if they are alive or they are around, I will say to them, may I do this practice, or may I be excused from this practice? And if they say yes, then I'll be excused. But if they're not around, and then I go to another guru, and they just simply override it, I am so sorry. No attainments. It cannot be. And to me, that's how we have to think about it. Older Tibetans in the monastery will say, sometimes, sometimes, when you stand up, you hit your head. When you sit down, you hit your butt. How are we to do this? One group or one sect or one school or one tradition will say this. Another one will say this. And then you've taken whatever from both. Very, very difficult. And that is why, that is why, to avoid politics, to avoid conflict, to avoid conflict in people's mind, I discourage people to run from center to center to center, lama to lama to lama, initiation to initiation to initiation. Why is that? Instead of getting people who are bright lights that light up a room, the bulb fuses. Why is that? They become more confused. If you've reached a certain level of practice and you request your lama and he says yes, then definitely that would benefit you. If you, if you have not um, kasa, reached a certain level and you run here and there, you will become more confused. And we can see that these days with many issues. 
not one or two, many issues where people are actually quite confused about certain issues in Tibetan Buddhism, quite, quite confused. And what they choose to do now is not even to talk about it anymore. And I find, okay, that's all right. Why? Confusion. And so for me, I like to stick to simplicity. Whatever sect you belong to, practice your sect well. Whatever lama you belong to, practice your lama well. Which one's your lama if you run around doing a few lamas? And sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes you're not evil to run here, run there. Because, you know, when, when, when Tibetan Buddhism first hit the scene here, it was very, it's, it still is, it's pretty cool. All these lamas from Shangri-La flying in, you know, literally flying in on airplanes here. And uh, they're, you know, his eminence, his blah, his this, his that. And they're giving initiation teachings. And wow, initiation, you know, yidam and, and mantra and power and transformation. It's instant. We think that. And then we go for initiation. He goes, well, you mean I have to make an effort? <laughs> you mean I have to do a three-year, three-month, three-day retreat? You mean I have to give up my jewels and, and, and renunciation? And I have to practice, you know, take vows? What? I have 36 vows? What? And, you know, they tell you the surprise, you know. And by the way, I'm your root guru for the rest of your life. You don't do what I say, you go to hell. <laughs> they go, oh. you leave the initiation going, oh, but I thought I was going to see you dumb, get some magic powers and a secret mantra. You did. But it doesn't work immediately. We forgot to tell you. <laughs> Doesn't work immediately, but it will work. It will work. I don't recommend people running here and there, and I repeat that over and over again, to protect everyone. To protect. If I've been interested in numbers and people, my assistants and people who are close to me would have detected that many years ago. They go, I say, go, whatever, I don't mind. Some come back, some go, some don't, don't, whatever. It's okay, whatever. Some say criticize and say, I'm like this, I'm not good, my practice is no good, my lineage is no good, I'm not real, whatever. It's a, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me, I'll tell you why. When it's been said enough, it doesn't bother you anymore. And I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's been said enough about me, it doesn't bother me anymore. I'm used to it. My friends are still friends, and the people who are loyal and people who know the practice, they'll stick around. The ones who don't, they'll go off at the drop of a hat anyways, whatever. Doesn't matter. Even if I had close people criticize me and say negative things about me for years and years, it's okay. It doesn't bother me. I'll tell you why. Truth will be revealed. There is karma. There is a dharma protector. And I don't look at things from one lifetime perspective, many lifetimes. What I do for people, I look at many lifetimes perspective, not just one. So in this life, some of them may be murdered, murdered in poverty and say, I have problems with finance, blah, 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 blah. Yes, now I may or may not be able to help you with that, but I will help you with not taking a negative rebirth, that you'll have a different situation in the future. So I don't look at a one lifetime situation. I look at the bigger picture. That's why I don't entertain so much all kinds of silly divinations. I'm sorry to call it silly, that is stuck with one period, one time, one season. I don't, because why? bigger than that. It's a bigger picture. In any case, being devoted to one center, helping out in one center, assisting in one center, doing things in one center, and making it grow, you will see that when you do that in a center, you yourself will grow. And sometimes we need to find a center that we have affinity with. And that center must be free of any type of politics, in any way. I'll tell you why. We come to a center for spiritual practice. And unfortunately, in all centers, there are politics, so there are people. So what we need to do is we don't engage in politics. Other people in center may. We don't have to. We engage in practice. And as time goes on, we will prove who we are and how we are and what we are. When we practice, when we practice guru devotion well, and we're very devoted to our gurus, we, among many benefits, we will collect the type of benefit that we will meet other great masters and receive teachings from them that does not conflict with our guru. And in fact, receiving teachings from them will instill the faith in our guru even stronger. So when we have good guru devotion and strong and firm, without planning, without wanting, without knowing, without even any idea, you will meet other great masters. Just like that. It's happened to me many times. I have many, many stories explained about that to me. So when we have proper Guru devotion, we will meet great beings, great masters, just as we have planned. And 
when we meet a great master, when we meet great masters and we, and we study under our master and we're devoted, we will be able to see, eventually have dreams of enlightened beings and we will be able to see enlightened beings. If you have devotion to your guru and you can see your guru as an enlightened being, you will create the causes for yourself to actually see the enlightened being. Why? That's the gap, the bridge between. If you can see the good qualities of your guru, then you know there are good qualities you can aspire to. If you cannot see good qualities in your guru, yet you call him your guru, yet you go in only when you're in the mood, when you can, or when, when money allows you, or a certain time allows you, or fun allows you, or not allows you, when he's only your guru, or she's only your guru, fair weather guru, how can you expect to see good qualities? When you see good qualities in your teacher, when you meditate on good qualities in your teacher, you realize there are good qualities to actually develop. Develop. And when you're able to see those good qualities in your guru and you develop those good qualities, you will reach the level that you can see extraordinary beings. So therefore, if you cannot see your guru as an extraordinary being, you will not be able to see an extraordinary being. It is impossible for someone who has no guru devotion. It is impossible for someone who has no strength in guru devotion. And it is fully impossible in this life for a person who disparages or says negative things or hints negatively towards their guru or discourages the practice of other beings to the guru. There is no way they can gain attainments. The one who speaks and the one who doubts. No way. Why? Once you don't see your guru with good qualities, then the, Dharma, then the attendants don't, then the Dharma brothers and sisters don't, then this lama don't, that lama don't. And once you suspect your lama, you'll suspect other lamas, you suspect this lama. Pretty much one day we'll just suspect his holiness there's something wrong. Then we go back to Buddha Shakyamuni, there's something wrong. Then eventually everybody's wrong. So if everybody's wrong, everybody's wrong, there is no good qualities developed. There is no qualities developed. To accept that kind of thinking doesn't mean there is no bad qualities. It means to focus on the good qualities. And in that process, the negative qualities will drop away. So you can see reality. So when we have good guru devotion, when we have good guru practice, we create the causes to have pure view of others. When we have good guru devotion, we will see immediately our relationship with other people will become better. People who have good, bad guru devotion, they don't have many friends. People always doubt their guru or fight or disparage or say negative things or discourage other people, say negative or ugly things and pull them away or whatever. Watch them. They usually don't have many friends around them. Why? How they relate to someone so kind to them negatively, they will definitely relate to other people who are not kind to them even more negative. And if those, these kind of people are nice to you, they have motive one. Why do they have motive? If they can treat their guru like that, who is everybody else? And the guru is the only link to a Buddha for you, the one that can speak help you, advise, teach, give you love, take care of you and nurture you. So if you disparage your guru, you disparage negatively your teachers. If you disparage. Or if you hear some qualities about other teachers and you encourage other people to feel negatively about their guru, it's very bad. Very, very bad. Why? You cut all chances for you to see good qualities in others. You cut good qualities to see Good, you cut any chance to see good qualities in the Buddha or even to see a Buddha. And eventually, you will cut all chances for you to see any good qualities or develop in yourself. Why? Who can develop good qualities on their own, not in dependence on anyone? Good qualities are, are developed in dependence with everybody around us. When someone tests our patience, we develop patience. So without others, it is impossible for us to develop any type of good qualities. Therefore, we're very interdependent. Compassion is reality. Afflicted perception and emotion is not. So we should stick to our center. And I don't mean this as an indirect encouragement to myself, but if it seems like that, I am sorry. We should stick to our lamas. We should stick to our lineage and our practice. How do we know which ones are lama? When we have a few, some of us may have a few, the one who has been most kind to us, given us the most teachings, taught us the most, nurtured us, watched us, given us gifts, wrote us notes, been there for us when we were down. Then we visualize this person as our root guru and all the other great gurus dissolve into them. So when we prostrate to this one guru, we're prostrating to all the gurus. I have 14 gurus. 
and um, the one that takes care of us, the one we've received teachings from. And people say, oh, the one I took, um, I took um, refuge from is my root guru. Can be. So you took refuge from someone. Some of us, you know, there are some gurus you put refuge, you fill out a form, send in $15, and you took refuge. I'm not being critical. There are some people like that. It's good and bad, no. Yes, it's all right. Maybe if some gurus are very, very big and they have a lot of disciples, it can be like that. I'm not criticizing. But my point is, but then there's another guru who's been sweating in the sun, you know, kissing your, your butt here, and taking care of you, and watching you, and putting up with your bitch fits for years and years and years. And then that's not your root guru, and you treat them like, you know, your manservant. No. No. Who's your guru? Is the one who gives you the most teachings. The one that cares for you. The one that takes care of you. That is your guru. And some people say, no, that's not my guru because I didn't receive refuge or initiation from him. Then who is your guru? The guy in the sky who gave you refuge for a half hour and you never see the guy again. You, don't, you can't even speak their lingo. You know, they speak Tibetan, they use, speak English. That's ridiculous. No, that's ridiculous. That's why people who don't understand Dharma, they say all kinds of ridiculous, funny things. You go, ooh, interesting. I write notes because I want to debate later on with them. So, that's very, very important. And it says in the Guru devotions, if people disparage our Guru, say negative things, we are not supposed to eat with them. Write any letters to them, associate with them, go with them, or be with them at all. Unless our practice is very stable, our mind cannot fall, and we can influence them. How can we tell if they start influencing us against our Guru, and they say negative things, it is a sign that it is not time for us to help. We should stay away. That's what it says in 50 verses. For those of us who associate with these type of people, and we can in fact bring them back, and it doesn't affect us at all and create any doubts, then we can do that. So it says we shouldn't associate or even eat or be with these people who say negative, disparaging things about our guru. Why? It's protection for them and you. You don't give them opportunities to say more negative things, and you don't give yourself an opportunity to fall so that in the future you can't help them at all. Never mind them, all sentient beings. Why focus on one? So these type of beings, we're not even supposed to associate with them, be with them, go near them at all. And if we keep doing that at this level and they discourage us and we receive tantric teachings, it's very dangerous. So, but if we're strong in our practice, means our mind is immovable, by all means help them. That is the truth be told, if truth needs to be told. 